And I think we are live. Can you see on top of the window, which means we are live. So good um, afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Godox Facebook Live. This is Aris Tao. And um, today we are very honored to uh, invite Greg, Greg Daniel to share his secret uh, with family portrait and uh, everything you know relevant with family portrait. Uh, Greg has a, such a such my dream sort of career. Every single title of his, I, I probably need to spend another twenty years to get there. Let me start with PPA president uh, between two two thousand twenty and two thousand twenty one. Uh, fellow. American Society of Photographers. Now remind me that I'm just, uh, I'm still working on my associate <laughs> ship. And uh, camera craftsman of America, master photographer, photographic craftsman, certified professional photographer. Um, he has such a long list. I will just, um, I will just leave it there. I will leave Greg to, um, to share his stories and his business model and his, uh, his particular style of family portrait, which I quite enjoy, which is dreaming, um, simplistic, minimalistic, and also which I quite enjoy, um, classic. And well, I will save the talk and let Greg take over, shall we? Thank you. Thank you. Thank Do you want you. me to Thank share the screen now or? Uh, yeah, go ahead and share the screen. That'd be good. So just to to start off with, Aries, I, I saw this amazing, amazing thing that you put on, I believe, about nature and the, the model with all of the, the, that was fantastic, so inspirational. I would encourage everybody to go take a look at that video. It's relatively short, but it is packed full of fabulous, amazing, you're an incredible creative photographer. Thank you. I just love the way you blended uh, blended the photography and the story and the art all together. So anyway, I, what I'll do is I thought I thought well I'll share a little bit of my background, a little bit about what we do here at uh, at our studio and what we do for our clients. Uh, so we'll give you that kind of background and give you a little inspiration on how we shifted and pivoted from what we used to be. So. I started the company back when I was 19 in 1979. So I have a lot of rings on my tree and that is probably why I have all of those little uh, initials behind my name. I had plenty of time to accrue a lot of that. And, um, and so I started off as, a, as basically a high-end wedding photographer and we did over 600 weddings. I, have, I photographed tons of weddings in the trenches and I uh, got a lot of what I would call combat wedding training underneath my belt. And uh, so it makes what we do today much, much easier to be able to work on the fly and to be able to uh, have a toolbox filled with knowledge that I can grab that tool out and use it whenever I want to. Interestingly enough, though, uh, we don't we don't use all the tools in the toolbox. We only use some of them each time. So um, I'm going to share some of those tools and some of those great tools that Godox has that's really added to my toolbox. So let me get in here. And I think I just had a light go out. Let me take a look if I can turn it on real quick. No worries. Took your time. Hi, guys. Hello from Nigeria. What's the time there? Hello, Emmanuel. How are you? There we go. Okay, so getting on with it. So there's a couple of things that we do. We just very simplistically now is that we we are mainly portrait photographers, right? And and uh, we just we design this personalized art for our clients' beautiful homes, and we do it in um, very unique ways, and we design them very unique places. And we've got incredible clients that commission us to do these pieces. 
And, I, and in a little while, I'll talk about how that came about. How did I transition from a wedding photographer doing high-end uh, wedding photography on the weekends to uh, this high-end, detailed, commissioned portrait artist work? And we did that back in the 90s. So I, that's, that's exactly what we are today. And we love doing what we do, Lisa and I, uh, every day. I love getting up and creating these pieces of art for our clients every day. It just fills me up, fills my love tank up. And I think I'll just try to share some of that with you. So these are kind of the crazy spots that we might have to deal with. That's a 16 foot portrait. And uh, so when, you know, we walk into a space, we have to determine, you know, pre-consultation, figure out uh, the, the, the color harmony, the balance, what kind of clothing they're going to wear, where we're going to do it, how it will blend with the, with the environment that they're in. Uh, and that, it looks like a piece of furniture or a furnishing that goes along harmonious with the, with the whole area. So that's our goal with each client that commissions us to do these pieces. So they're very well thought out, very well planned. Uh, Lisa, as I mentioned before, my beautiful wife, she takes care of all of the consultation piece. And um, she is what I would call someone that takes, takes care of the beginning piece of the artist so that if I walk up to a blank canvas, I have all my color palette here. I have all of my tools in front of me and all of the things that I need to be able to create this piece of art. Uh, so she designs all of that. So I know if it's going to be vertical. I know if it's going to be horizontal. I know if it needs to be fitting in a niche, per, like something like this. And uh, I know what time of day we're going to be creating for the mood that we're going to, that we're going to go with. Uh, next slide here is kind of showing Lisa doing a part of that. She has a little helper there that was coloring in the meantime. This is one of our clients. It's a typical thing that we would do. And I thought I'd take you through a little bit of a typical step-by-step uh, -step kind of session. So this is one that we went in. That was the focal point in their wall. That was kind of the wild wall in their family room. They were really all about family. Uh, and, and they wanted a piece that represented who they were as a family on that particular wall. So we looked at it. We measured it. We've got the, the ruler there. So we know we're going to we're going to photograph this wall, take a picture of it with the iPhone uh, ahead of time so that I know when I go in the design mode uh, how big we're going to make it, what it's going to look like even before we finish it out. Right. So uh, and the, it engages it engages the client in, in the preparation and the collaboration process. Uh, like anyone, like if you were to redo your kitchen or have a designer come in and help you with a room, uh, it's a whole thing about collaboration and, and knowing what. Uh, your clients need and trying to fill those needs, you know, tailor made for that for the client. Uh, so, uh, then the next major state uh, stage is to do the actual session itself. So, I have my color palette, I know what I'm going to be working with. And uh, so, I go out on location in this case. They wanted to uh, go to the beach because that was something that meant a lot to them. And, uh, uh, Greg. Yeah, Sorry, uh, if I may interrupt. So Jackie is asking a question, says, what kind of lens do you use for family photography? Would you, would that something you're going to address later uh, or you want to address now? Well, I'll, 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 address, I'll show you uh, what's in my bag a little bit, okay. but I will address them as they go along. Absolutely. We'll talk okay. about it. All right. Stay tuned, well, Jackie. We will discuss uh, I'll, I'll it later. Uh, if on this particular case, on this particular question, I carry two lenses in my bag. One that I could actually spot weld on and be happy would be a 70 to 200 because it pretty much uh, serves all purposes that I would need if I had to only have one lens. I have a 2470 that's in there as well. And uh, I'll put one on one camera and one on another camera uh, and walk. I, you're only seeing me with one camera in my hand here, but often I'll have two cameras depending on the situation where I'm trying to create and what I'm trying to create. Uh, but typically, most of the time, it would be a, a 70 to 200 that I'd be using on that particular camera and that particular lens. So, yeah, so we have another question. There you go, Jackie. So, no. well, all good. Please go ahead. So, here we are at the beach. We've got the color palette. We know uh, what time of day we're going to be photographing. This is going to be towards when we do the beach sessions, it's, it's the last hour of the day. Uh, and so we're going to be dealing, we know what kind of light we're going to be dealing with, and I'll only have to put splashes light in 
And I will show that uh, the light that we use and the Godox light that we use, 300, 8300 that we use, I'll show you uh, that in play. I don't have an example of that on that particular image, but this is what it would look like. So we're off to the left. Lisa's holding that light uh, with a uh, with a mono stand, and I will I do have an example of another session in a little bit where it will show that. And so we're just we're just adding to the light. So what I'm what I'm interested in in something like this is creating uh, creating a scene and a story and and. And they, they wanted family. So all of these colors were something that they wanted in accent colors in the home. We needed it horizontal. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to create a feeling with it. And so from, from a lighting standpoint, uh, I, a lot of my work is environmental. And so I'm lighting in terms of the scene first. You know, I'm trying to use all of the available light possible and exposing for that and then if I need some additional light, some accent light, uh, then I'll bring in, say, this AD300, for example, and give us a little splash and bring up just enough uh, where it doesn't look overlit, but blends with it and accents with it. I'll talk about a little bit about why we do what we do, but the products that we create are painted products. So we start off with photography, and then I go into Photoshop and do um, and do any kind of compositional correction or changing that I need to do, and then and then after Photoshop, I would go into a painter program called Corel, and Corel allows me to do digital painting all the way down to the eyelash. So I paint every pixel that's on the image, and then we output it to uh, as you might imagine G clay so it's inlaid inks in the canvas and so we use a very large Canon printer which is right here on my right and we will uh, we will inlay those inks in the canvas and then I will uh, apply acrylics and oils and varnish to finish it out so it's a, it's part of the embellished reproduction process in the art community we started this back in the 90s and I'll show you my inspiration for that in a, in a couple of minutes here this oh, is look, uh, at the, look at the strokes. Yeah. This is part of the embellishing process. Uh, looks like I'm working on the acrylics on this particular part of it. So we're covering the entire image with acrylics first as the first layer, giving it more dimension and dimensionality and uh, using the brush strokes to accent any kind of uh, composition in the image or elements I want to have stand out. This, let's see if this will play. So this looks like, this is after I've already applied the oils of the embellishment and this is varnish that we're putting on the top of. Kind of see it, get, it blends all of those uh, acrylics and oils that I put on top and blends it together and we get a beautiful satiny gloss finish on the top of it. Now, one of the most important things is the delivery process. And so we want to make sure we follow through all the way to the end. And I install all these pieces myself in the delivery process. We want to make sure that it is over the top and that the experience that they get is uh, the best unexpected experience that you can imagine. So Craig, if, I, if, Go ahead. I, if I may interrupt, um, here is a question. Ask about your fantastic background. It says, interested to know you have two B flat looking objects behind you. Oh my God. Yeah. We have Char Sherlock here. Uh, camera <laughs> laptop, the live stream. Uh, what are those exactly? Are they collapsible? <laughs> Are they talking about those right there? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So those, those, yes, those are collapsible, but those are, uh, I believe, Westcott. Um, mm. And they're silver on one side and white on the other. There's a North Light window that runs the whole bank behind my easel here. And that North Light, you can't really see the light, it's, it's hidden by my easel. And so uh, that's all bank. Yeah. 
And so I use a lot of those reflectors for that. So that's used to cut off the natural light or? So we, I can use it to go bow. I can use them to go okay. bow. I can use them to reflect uh, back in natural light. One, I like two of them because if I am doing all natural light, then I might use one to do some sort of re reflector or fill up shadow light, yeah. coming out of the light. And then the other uh, might be a silver reflector that pops light back on the background. So I can control the volume of light on the background if I'm dealing with window light. So one's basically a background light and one's basically a fill light uh, when I'm using window. The other way I use them is, uh, and I do have a studio image using these Godox lights, uh, a, a self-portrait of me while I was testing out some of the lighting that um, I don't think I utilize the V flats with it, but it, it, you might see them in it. Mm. They're not V flats. All right, so here's your answer. <laughs> Smart up. I like, I like her portrait that she's got her bio. Yeah. Side. Kind of cute. Kind of cute. Yeah. Yeah. So what I, so one of the things that we do, it, people love this, you know, it's a, it's a white glove experience every time and I'll sign the back in front of them, you know, the front signed. And we also have a seal on the front, a wax seal for the paintings. And then, and then I'll sign the back of it in front of them and, and maybe put a little something on it. And they just, love that little that little embellishment process during the installation this is the installation itself let's see I, where did my what that spot okay where did my there it is okay lost my powerpoint here for a second okay so here is the installing it so oh. I install either I physically install them all myself or I'll if they're really complicated and large and on strange things like mirrors and stuff like that I will have a professional come in that does that type of thing would do install for us and then I'll just pull a corner and get a picture for Instagram as I'm holding it up helping making it look like I'm actually installing it and so this is the finished piece so we like to also photograph. I quite enjoy how the color palettes works with the stays and also you know the the, the walls. It's just good. Is that cool? Light and airy and beautiful. So cool. So cool. Yeah. And uh, here's a sorry. Here's a question from Mark. He would interested to know. Call yourself a photographer or an artist? So on our sign, we call, we call ourselves a portrait artist. Mm. And we have since the 90s. Uh, even on our sign, it's uh, Gregory Daniel Portrait Artist. Uh, so we utilize mixed media to create the products that we create. And so in the art community, that would be referred to as mixed media. Um, we use the terminology of embellished reproductions because that's what a lot of people uh, understand in our community what it is. We also do offer just regular studio photography. Uh, and and I've been doing some artist projects and that deal with film, which is really fun. We've been doing some really cool, fun stuff with the artist projects. So from an inspirational standpoint, um, this guy. This guy changed my world, rocked my life, and, and I, saw his gallery in San Francisco. This is the actual pickup card that I picked up in, I think it was 1991. Uh, and uh, I was at that time struggling a little bit because I, I, I was this high-end wedding photographer doing incredibly well. I guess you would say we were on top of the mountain with it, it was doing a lot of speaking and engagements and things and traveling for Kodak. It, it was something that you know I could have only wished for in the beginning of my career to have gotten where we got. But what I was struck is we had young children that were entering school and going for on the weekends, doing school events and that sort of thing. And so that lifestyle was rather difficult uh, to maneuver around and torn between my profession and between our family as far as you know taking time away. 
So for us, it became a thing like, I just, I need to change the business model from now. And I was struggling exactly what that might look like, what that would do. And my wife was a ballerina. And uh, so I have a really, you know, a heart for uh, ballet and the arts for that sort of thing. And so when we walked in this gallery, and I love art galleries, I'd always loved art galleries. A lot of our products were created through looking at art galleries and then uh, and I loved drawing and that sort of thing, but I never thought as, you know, I would be a painting artist. And I walked into this gallery and this gentleman, uh, uh, his work, this gallery was filled with these large realistic paintings that were stunning. And this particular series that was in here was of ballerinas. And I was blown away by just the oils and the paints and the detail and it looked photographic, but then it looked like a painting, you know, it was so incredibly powerful and moving for me. And the whole gallery scene of it was just moving. And I thought, Oh my gosh, this is so gorgeous. I was so impressed. But what was interesting is I looked at this piece, the piece that you see here that was there from that lift up card, the, that image, that painting was there. The original was there. And it was $80,000. <laughs> this is back in 1990, $80,000 for that painting. And it was about a 40, 45 inch painting. And then there was one that looked exactly like it that was on the other side. And it was, and I, I couldn't understand because it, it looked exactly like it, but it was had a price tag of $8,000 on it. I thought they must have misprinted this one and he painted two paintings. And I asked the curator to come over and explain what, what is, is this a misprint? And he said, no, 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 this is, this is called an embellished production. It was the very beginning of the embellished reproduction stage in the art community. And, and he said, so there's this thing, you know, back before then really painters could only like do lithographs and, photographs and posters and reproductions of their paintings, right? Now, he said, what they're able to do is they actually photograph the painting and then they put it in this program called Photoshop. It's a brand new thing that came out, he said. <laughs> and I, and I'm, like, I'm familiar with Photoshop. And um, he said they're able then to output it and they inlay these inks into Canvas, which is a new process from Photoshop. So you can have a digital printer inlay the inks in the Canvas. They call it G Clay, and the guy had an accent, and it sounded really cool. And so he shared all of that. And then he goes, and then he is able to take it, stretch it, and then embellish it with some embellishments. And it doesn't take him near as long as starting from scratch. And finds it, lacquers it and it's an embellished reproduction. And I turned to my wife and said, I can create this in my world. I can create personalized art that's not of somebody else's ballerina, but it's of the ballerina you want in that piece. I can create that at the, I'd be happy at the $8,000 rate <laughs> per piece, you know? And so that's when it started. And that's how we created that whole business model we infused um, the art world and those processes that they were creating for embellished reproductions into the photography world. And that's what we've been doing ever since is just working and working and working and refining and refining people that made that process incredibly, incredibly prolific was people like Thomas Kincaid. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's an artist that became incredibly prolific. He could never have done what he did without having the embellished reproduction process. So if he had been born earlier, or it would never have been able to take place um, because that's the way painters are able to do embellished reproductions. Most of the galleries are just full now of embellished reproductions. We sell lots and lots and lots. So that, that is that. And let me just share a couple of the images uh, that inspired me from him. So this is, this is some of his work. And he celebrates a lot lighting, which is beautiful, right? I just love, I love the lighting uh, that he uses and how he sees, um, how he sees things and how he sees through three dimensionally with the light and with the scene. So I just, 
really enjoyed studying his work and how he plays with light and how it it works like you know strong light versus soft light in the lines and the design these are just absolutely gorgeous pieces to study and look at and just a lesson in color harmony balance lighting and design so just I, ever since then, I've had a dance project, dancer project, artist project going on. You can see some of them on our website if you go into artist projects. One of the projects is uh, the dancer project. And it's been going on and ongoing. It's kind of an ongoing project for myself. And, um, and I just love doing it. So let me just show you a few of those images that are part of it. And you can see, I think, the inspiration from... Um, from that particular artist and what kind of what kind of inspiration he has given me for that type of that type of work. Uh, so this is this is the whole starts off with photography and and uh, and ends with the embellished reproduction process. Here's another one. This is mainly just to show you um, just the inspiration from that artist and how it led me into doing uh, how all of this art actually applies to our day-to-day -day commissions. So these aren't as much commissions as these are artist projects mainly. Some of these were commissioned uh, by these dancers or parents, uh, but a lot of them I do to express myself and to you know, express my creativity and give homage to the artist, so. This is what I'm working on right now. This was commissioned, uh, this particular individual, and that's what's on the easel right now. I'm working on the piece. Um, and so we're really excited that the client has not even seen it yet. And so they'll come in and it will be finished on the easel for them to see. Here's another one in that same look, but you can see all the different light in the way we use light. Same with this one. This is a different, a different ballerina. So it's not just that we do it with ballet, you know, with ballerinas. These are, we do it with children and debutantes and, uh, you know, anything. Okay, so here's my bag. Here's what's in the bag. Uh, so I love the V1. The V1 is great, and I'll show you in a little bit uh, some of the images that we've done and how we use that V1. For a couple of reasons, I love the V1. One is that it can give me just a little accent light and little nook areas, things to just bring up a little bit of brilliance in the image maybe add a little background pop, maybe put a pin light behind someone. It's very flexible, very easy to use. And it also, uh, and I've not used it for this, but it's also, it can dual as a transmitter. Is that right, Aries? So you could actually- Yes, it can be used to trigger 8300 and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, I've not used it for that, but it, it's nice to know that I have a backup transmitter if something happened to the one that I have on my, on my camera which is wonderful. And I like that it has these little attachments and I'll show you a couple of those attachments. And I have the V1 right here, you can see it. And I'll show you a couple of the attachments and how I use them, um, how I use them for a couple of the photographs. The, I have three and I got, I, I ordered three 300s, AD 300s because um, I really like the ability to have to be able to do work here in the studio and be able to have uh, 
what I call a transitional light, which I'll show you, and uh, a main light and a background light or a kicker light. And so I like the ability to have that, especially for here and on location if I need that many lights. I don't normally, but I do have a, where I photographed a, an album cover for a pianist just the other day. And I'll show you that and how we utilized these lights. So it's nice to have those three lights and I carry them around in a very small bag, which is amazing that they can fit in these really small bags. Uh, I have the larger, uh, was it the Octabox, the 120 CM Octabox? And that's, that's really nice for a beautiful trans, transitional fill light. And then I have a couple, a couple of the AD um, S85Ws. And these are really, or 65, right? These are really sweet little guys. Like this a lot. Handy, handy. So, and then I'm going to show you where I have a translucent piece of material that's a PhotoFlex light panel. And we're going to be showing you that later on in the video, how I use that light panel occasionally. Not very often, but I'll use it occasionally when I need to. I feel like I'm rambling. Am I okay? <laughs> Is this going okay? Hi, it's all good. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, so I bring two cameras along with me, five DSs. I use a Canon 5DS, the very large sensors. And I do that because I'm dealing with very large pieces of art. And so I really need that fidelity and really high resolution so that I can paint all the way down to the eyelash and have lots of tooth to work with in the painting process. There's the two lenses that were asked about earlier. Uh, 70, 200, 28, and then the 2470. And I have the Sakonic that I don't need the, I don't feel the need. I have one of the really nice Sakonics. This one is really relatively inexpensive. And I like it because if I drop it, it doesn't break. <laughs> I've kicked this thing a lot around all over the place. It really has served its purpose well. And then I have this Omega reflector that we take with us. So that's pretty much what's in the bag. I actually have a personal question. I'm actually quite curious in terms of family photography. When would you actually use the translucent um, umbrella? And when would you use the uh, reflective umbrella with diffusion? And when would you use the um, the softbox? Like, would you find them have deliver different kinds of quality of lights or? Exactly. It's definitely about the quality of light. Um, so the translucent, that umbrella, boy, that's a beautiful thing. I can use it for a couple of things. I can use it actually to um, to go bow sunlight, direct sunlight on a subject if I needed to. So I can actually put in it in between a direct sun and say the subject, and that will allow me to bring down the exposure, you know, brings down the exposure and evens out the light on the subject. And then I can utilize that other light that's in the background, filling the environment and make it more of a higher key. So if I wanted to bring the key up in the environment, all I have to do is bring the light down on the subject and then expose for the subject and it'll bring the key up to the rest of the scene. Does that make sense? So that's a, that's a really good light for that. Another great reason is let's say I'm inside, um, I'm inside say a room this big uh, I can, and, and let's say the ceilings are incredibly high. So instead of bouncing off of a ceiling to try to create fill light to fill a scene, I can utilize this and shoot it through the umbrella and, and fill the scene up in a very, you know, shadowless kind of lighting situation. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a much more of a softer light to kind of bring up the volume in, uh, in an area with, with the scene. And so I can either bounce bounce it into it or shoot through it. It can act just like a bounce umbrella or you can shoot through it. It's very versatile in all of those. And if it's raining, you have a really big umbrella to put over the top of your equipment. <laughs> I do that all the time with my, with my clients. <laughs> yeah. And so the other, you know, the boxes, depending on if you want a bounce box, um, 
softbox, which is a bounce umbrella basically. And that's gonna be a little softer. And I love the baffles that are in your boxes, in the Godox boxes. I really enjoy having those baffles in there to kind of soften it up even more. Um, and then the smaller boxes, uh, those are really sweet. That, that bo the, the small, these boxes are crazy cool with this AD300. These boxes and this new mount is spectacular. And it keeps everything really, really small. But I mean, just that to be able to pop on your box is incredible and quick and really cool how it does that. So it makes it really easy uh, then to fold up and put in your bag and transport. Uh, but I really like that mount and it's really strong. So it feels sturdy and, and holds up really well in the environment, work environment. So very cool with that. I'm hoping soon that they'll come out with some, uh, and maybe they already have some grid spots and things like that that are attachments on, on the AD 300s. That's a yes. <laughs> so I, no, I just put in the comments, let everybody know it's, I think it's a Godox AD 65 W, right? Yes, I think it's 65. Yeah. So basically, guys, it's 65 centimeters. W means it's white. And uh, because it's Godox mount, so it's uh, way smaller than Bowen mount. So if you're a one man photographer or you have a small team, uh, it would be more ideal and lightweight uh, comparing with Go uh, Bowen mount. Yes. And, it, and it's really sturdy on the end of that. So it doesn't like flex or anything like that. It just goes on clicks and then um, and then comes back up. It's really, really easy, very fast, um, simple to work with. Any other questions on the equipment before we go in and show it in use? No, not so far. Um, not so far. Okay. All right, so here we go. This is Lisa holding it, so she has uh, she, this is a different actual softbox situation. This is a, um, a Fotec soft, soft light, I think it's called, something like that. And it's an umbrella just like uh, the Godox umbrella one as well. And that works in a very uh, And so she's holding the light with uh, it that's attached to, this is the AD300 attached to a mono stand. You can see it's just, we've exposed for the scene uh, and then we're adding just a little bit of light to bring up and uh, give us some modeling on their faces. There's also another, uh, there, there's also another uh, light on the back left side that is AD300 that is giving us a little kick light. Okay, and so this is the piece finished out. So that has all the paint work on it. This very, what we call tight and detailed paint work that's done on it. Very, very detailed. Do you want, um, Greg, would you mind just zooming a bit so we can see the details? Also, I, um, I have a personal question. Did you retouch out the light, you know? Um, no. The no, lighting no. assistant or? No, so this is just a wide angle view. Okay. Okay, and then, well, this is a this is a white angle. She's backed up some here, and then I've gone in just a little bit. So this is okay. different. So that's exactly what it is. So she I don't know that she backed up at all. So this is a wide angle shot. I took it with one camera, wide angle shot, and then I backed up with a seventy to two hundred and shot this. So you're she's oh, okay. still to the left, but it's everything's compressed. If you look at them, yeah. Okay and. What, zoom in. Let's see if we can. Zoom. I'm gonna zoom in here. It's kind of take your time. Really detailed. Yeah, I can see all the haze. Yeah, 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 yeah. So good. Cool. Thank you. Same family. Uh, if you actually went on my Instagram to take a look, you could see actually the 
finished products hanging in their home. So we just installed those about a week ago. Speak of which, Greg, would you mind just uh, leave your inst Instagram handle here so that people can follow you? Yeah, I think it's underscore Gregory Daniel. Do you want to change your name to um, to the Insta Instagram handle? I think that'll be easiest. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you click on your name, then that should say display name. Just just change your display name to um, to your Instagram. That's all. Uh, display name, and then I think it's I think it's at underscore. Only if you want to. I just thought, you know. I think that's it. I'm pretty sure that's it. Okay. Underscore Greg, Gregory Daniel. I yep. Think so. All right. Yep. Okay, so that's the other image. So they uh, they wanted to, they commissioned us to do a piece over top of their bed. That's what this one is. And then they wanted it to be done in metal. So that was the actual product that we used for that. And uh, and then the other, uh, they wanted uh, mounted on a glass wall, which was pretty cool looking. A metal piece that's floating on a glass wall, it was really cool looking. Mm. All right, let me see if I can get back to, there it is. There we go. Uh, Greg, before we head on to the next slide, here here we have two questions. Um, yeah, with our, good. Uh, do you want to go back to the Do you want to go back to the previous slide? Sure. Um, it says here it says. Can you read the question? Let me see. I have to move things to do that. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. How much time do I spend editing? Yeah one picture so editing is well if you count um it's a lot because because editing for me is photoshop that's one stage of editing and then the others i would i would imagine you would call all the paint work that i do on the on the piece editing as well so i could have you know i could have maybe eight hours it, and in some cases on just painting uh, the digital in the digital world of it. So we, I invest quite a bit of time and then there's all the time that I spend on the pot on the print itself doing the embellishment work on the top of it. And so you know, that could take hours and then, and then we have to let it dry and cure and then come back and keep and do some other processes to it. So this is a time consuming process that to create the mixed media piece of it. Sorry, we have another question. Would you remove the shadow cast by the poolside chair in the post? Well, you know, we Lisa and I talked about that when I created it. I wanted it there. Uh, and on posts, when we, we did have the option to take take that out, but this was such a modern home and it was a very graphic image. And I did it this way to have all this graphic design element to it that I felt from an artistic standpoint, it helped balance the right side uh, on, the, on the darkness of the right side with the balance of the left side. So I felt like it added uh, from an artistic standpoint, good design um, from a modern, modern standpoint and, uh, and added good balance to it. So. I won, <laughs> she, and she gave in. So, but my wife asked the exact same question. Good question. Uh, this particular one, yeah, I did want to point out. So, this in the in the back, you can see that little corridor. That that corridor, and that's what I'm getting asked right now, right? Is how many lights on this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and this, there's three lights not including the scene, which is the sunlight. So first is the exposure for the sunlight. That's to get the scene down. And then uh, it's the exposure for the main light. So we have a main light here on the left. So that's the, that's the AD300 on the left uh, in this soft box. 
And then there is uh, AD300 on the right, which is adding as a kick light. So if you see that rim light around that gentleman, the boy's arm and, and the, the mom mm-hmm. and dad, you'll see that little rim light. You're seeing that yeah. from the right light. The back light that's in the back, that corridor is black. So the exposure, uh, there was not available light that was going through that hole there. So it's just a big black hole. And those two little lights that are up in the ceiling behind that the dad, we're not going to create enough light to expose that, you know, get a proper exposure back there. And that little sheen, that little white sheen that you see the reflection on the floor, I wanted that there as well. So that sheen and that light that's lit up back there is all coming from this uh, this V1 with a dome, this dome on the top, and it has yeah. a stand on it. So mm-hmm. I'm just I'm doing that and in the back in that corridor, and then I'm taking the X Pro, and I've got the you know one of the channels, and I'm just spinning it and taking a couple of shots. I wasn't metering it. I started off low, lowest power on it. Uh, and then I'm just pulling it up a little bit until I feel like it's enough accent in the back. So I'll take a I'll fire, take a look, fire, take a look, and just dial. This is this is beautiful. This little guy right here is fantastic because it's full range on all the lights, uh, full range. So I can dial it all the way up or I dial it all the way down, down right from my camera, which is a beautiful thing. Nice, nice piece of equipment right here. And this is the X Pro. Very, very nice. Uh, I don't think we, I think the editing thing is a whole nother topic, but um, maybe just something in general for in 20 seconds or. What is your editing process? Well, and, you know, initially on this one, it's it's about it's really about design. So I think in terms of design or if I need to say take someone's uh, arm or, or face or expression or whatever from another image that I've done, so I'll, I'll capture a few images. And so I'm like trying to improve uh, the posing, the design, the elements of the image. I might stretch it a little bit for the design. Uh, I might, uh, like in this case, the boy on the right, he was over about a foot to the right. And so I slid him over to the left in the editing process just to create that beautiful triangular composition that that didn't make him feel like he was out too far. So things like that is what I'd be doing through the editing process. I'd also uh, want to make sure that my my whites are where I want them, my my blacks are where I want them, the shadows are are where I want. So this this thing will uh, have a really rich um, color balance and harmony. I might bring up some of the, uh, I might bring up some of the luminance in different colors to to add and blend, or, or some of the saturation in the different colors to add and blend. Um, I think R.A. Chris wants to know your general camera setup for this kind of shot. Camera setup. So in this case, mm. it, it's the seventy to three hundred, uh, the seventy to two hundred. Probably in this case, shooting at around 70 millimeters, uh, just because you're seeing this. Li- I wanted this little bit of a stretch, little bit of a feel of, of stretch to it, uh, and because I'm dealing with a group like this, I'm normally shooting at f/8. I definitely want to start off around f/8 uh, with the Canon and with that lens combination. Uh, I want to be able to have focus. Make sure I've got good sharp focus on this group of people, right? I do, the the enemy for me in painting and making these very large pieces is soft, too soft. Having a, one person out just a little bit. You know, the girl on the left, she's back just a little bit, and the boy on the right is in front just a little bit. And that's enough depth of field that can start to cause me issues if I'm not paying it really close attention to that. Is that helpful? Probably in this case, depending on... Uh, I, that's my priority, and now depending on the light is my shutter speed and ISO. I try to keep the ISO down around 200 if I can, two to 400, because again, these are going to be very large, and I want to make sure that I've got lots of good tight detail in the in the pixels, and 
So I want to stay around that range. So if at F8 in this case, uh, because I'm doing a group, I have to keep that uh, aperture down. That was kind of the first priority piece of it. Next one is the image quality, which is the, the ISO. So now I'm, I'm sacrificing shutter speed. So I might have to put it on a tripod, uh, depending on what time of day it is, to expose the shutter long enough, leave the shutter long enough to get the environment exposed. Uh, so in this case, it's probably around a 60th of a second. I would want to put that on a on a tripod so I wouldn't get any motion. And in some cases, I'll actually lock a mirror up to take it, just so I don't get any, any motion at all. Really, really large pieces to work with. I don't want any motion from my camera. So Abby is asking a question. Do you recommend a budget alternative to the 8300? I guess, uh, do you reckon, I think V1 is on the cheaper end, right? Um, do you reckon V1 can replace 8300 in your workflow? Or if not in the entire case, maybe in some circumstances, V1 can re replace 8300 or not? Uh, I think if you worked, if, if you weren't working with, larger groups, if you were working in individuals, I think, yes. I think it would probably uh, work well. I think with, um, you know, five, six or plus more people, I need a little bit more power, especially if I need my f-stops down when I'm dealing with that. So because you're, if you're dealing with maybe one, two people, uh, then your f-stops don't need to be near as tight and they can be, you know, you can shoot a little bit wider open. Uh, and I think even some cameras you can shoot, like, you know, different brands you might be able to shoot a little bit more open. But my particular brand, my particular camera, I feel like I need to have for larger groups that tighter shot. So if you can actually deal with just a, a couple of people, then higher uh, apertures would be, you know, wider open apertures. You don't need as much power. You probably could work with the V1s. Is that helpful? Mm. Thank you, Abby. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Greg. Abby Hirschok, answer. Another, uh, let's see what, we good? Okay. No, so, it's just uh, thank you, that's all. Oh, so this is uh, another situation where it's environment, family, the lighting scenario is the same. We're just not using the V1 to add any little punch lights. So this is two lights set up. Uh, actually, the, the AD300, hid behind the tree on the left and then the 8300 in a box just splashing the light to give us a little bit of volume on their faces just to bring it up a little bit this is our family our personal family photograph this year and uh, yeah so this has two lights as well uh main light exactly kind of set up as the last image on the left and then one on the right kicking. I'm actually, uh, I'm actually firing my camera with a Cam Ranger, with a with a through my iPhone behind my wife's back. So that's how we took that shot. <laughs> and coming up, this is Kyla and Bobby. This is on the right, and that's our youngest daughter, Kyla. And this is our oldest, Ashley Brooke, uh, and. Kyla Renee, she's actually a, a portrait painter for lots of photographers all over the world. And uh, she she just gave us our first, they just gave us our first granddaughter, which is absolutely incredible. We're gonna show that, set, I think if we have time, we'll show some of that video behind the scenes where we did that session. Another one, this has just one light, Lisa's holding that light uh, and she's walking with them next to them and just adding enough splash to give us just a little bit of volume just enough that it doesn't look like they're being lit another two lights set up uh, it's hidden you can kind of no you can't okay so it's on the left the box is up i'm wondering if i can see that little box there um the box is all the way up on the left and behind those palms and then there's a kick on the on the back right and so again, exposing for the scene and then adding just a little bit of, uh, of extra light to pop in. 
This is Lisa holding that light with the box. Is this the... Yeah, so this is the 85, right? So this is a little bigger. This is the little bigger box. The one I had that I showed you was the 65 is a little bit smaller. 65, I like this little bigger one, the, the little larger one out on location as the main and this other one as the kick. You know, just have a little kick light. So in this case, I want to show you some of the images. So yeah, here it is. So this is the main. This is at F8. Remember, I wanted F8 for things like this. The box, the 5D at the, at the 5, 6. Let's see. Can't, okay, the, the lights at... That should have... That, uh, okay, here we go. That's... Okay. Here we go. It should have been... It's in... It's at F8. I shot this at F8. I don't know why it says 5, 6 here. Misprint. Okay, so here are some of the images from that session. That just has that little bit of light, little light pop. It's beautiful, beautiful light. So here's a little studio setup. And so we have the main light with the 85 uh, overhead. And then this is the Octabox, which is the umbrella box. These have the AB300s in them. And then this, this is kind of sweet. This is, I had, I can, I, I lit it a couple different ways, just kind of show you. I don't, I only have this particular one here. That's with the smaller box over here on the right. But I was using that as the, um, uh, as just to give me a little spot here. But I really like this. This is why I wanted to show you this. This is when you talk about one or the other lights. In this case, the this um, this V1 is works really beautiful with a grid on it. So that little kit that you get or that you can purchase separately, and you can have this little grid spot. And this little grid spot's beautiful for using on backgrounds and giving a little separation uh, for the background. I just loved it for that. And I just had a little attachment to hook it onto my stand over there. Uh, works out really well with that grid spot. So there it is. Settings. Okay, so this one, I, I wanted to show you this because I just did this the other day. Uh, for this client that needed a, an album cover done. And I just thought these lights perform so well here. And it's just a great example of using the three lights uh, in a really cool wrap way. And I just wanted to share that with you. That, so in this case, we've got that little V1 here that's inside the piano with the dome on it. And that's giving us beautiful light just splashing around inside lighting up bringing up the volume to show inside that piano so that was really cool the environment i wanted dark to go with the clothing that she was wearing in the scene so what was there you knew it was kind of there as a hint but it wasn't you know it wasn't really in detail this was uh this was created sanctuary and that's not what she was going after necessarily. And so we just wanted it to feel like it was theater, you know, that maybe this could be in a theater uh, where she was recording, you know. And, and so there's a kick light back here, the AD300, and it's, it's at F4. Now, if you take a look at the, what, the way I would normally look at this is I would start with what I call a transitional fill light. So for me, a transitional fill light is like back here in the back. You see this back light? It's a bit larger. And for me, if you think about what we were talking about in the studio here, I have a big bank of windows. And I love that real natural kind of feel of a natural light wrapping around a subject. So I really like a big bank kind of what I would call a transitional feel to give dimension. 
Same thing with all my environmental lighting. The sun and environment does that for me, right? And so I love that lighting that gives me that wrap, that three-dimensional look to it. And so this would be like giving us that environmental lighting, which I'm calling transitional feel. The main light is giving me chiseling or carving or creating dimension in the face so I can see that, that kind of light. And then I have uh, the other lights as a kicker light or accent lights. So back to this again. So our transitional fill is off here to the right, giving us a little bit of a wrap here. And then we have the main light giving us that dimension, you know, giving us that creating that short loop lighting on her. And then the V1 with the soft dome is popping up, giving us exposure inside. And then we have a kick light that's shooting through that triangle that uh, the lid and giving us the rim light on her hair, giving us that separation to the background. Same, very similar setup here. In this case, uh, I wanted to completely drop the background out. So I just increased the exposure on the camera a little bit and dropped that, uh, the, uh, the shutter speed so that I could just drop that out a little bit, make it a little bit darker. Her son is on the album with her. So we did an image of him as well. Same kind of lighting setup and the daughter is on that album as well. So we just did, they wanted a couple of little images that go in the, inside the cover. All right, so if you would like, we'll take you on a little journey for the next little bit and talk about this session that we did of my new grandchild, Evie Rose, Kyle and Bobby's uh, beautiful little child here. So, what was kind of unique about this is Kyla wanted, she wanted this really light and airy feel, okay? And that's not typically what I, my imagery is, as you've seen the things that I've shown you so far, this light and airy inside the house kind of situation. And in Florida, it's like really hot right now. So uh, she wanted it inside the house, but she wanted to have that outdoor kind of light, airy feeling to it. I'm like, okay, so I did some light and airy kind of searches, kind of see what in the world is she talking about? And most all of that technique uh, was totally against my grain of, of education and background and having really great exposure. It was all about, you know, creating it underexposed and then destroying <laughs> destroying the file basically to create this really light and airy look to it and I'm like oh I can't do that so I was I was wanting to mix the outside with the inside so I did this I thought you know these lights will be able to do this and so I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey we filmed some of the behind the scenes of it and kind of talk how we created these how we created these images All right. Well, this, yeah, this is just, this is just me loading up. So that, this is kind of interesting. Some people might be interested in it. This cart I have, this is, it's from ProCameraCase.com and they sell these carts that are kind of cool. And I like them because I can take them out to the beach. I can take them out on location. I can put my uh, stands on them, uh, my Godox lights are on the top there in my camera bag that just sits on the top in my camera bag. My cameras are in that bag below. So it makes a really cool, easy, uh, packable and movable solution, especially on the beach. So let's get on to where we get to the house, I think. Yeah. So we can go forward a little bit. This is where Lisa comes in the picture. Lisa is filming this so that we could share this with you guys. So we could probably get through some of that. Let me see if I can get my, while you're doing that, getting to the next phase, I will try to see if I can get the light back on here. Uh, 
Okay. So it just kind of shows you, I it, sometimes I'll actually even put a stand on it. Uh, if I, let's say Lisa is helping with a small child and I need to have uh, the stand to hold it. So I'll just maybe put a stand and have a clamp on it to hold the stand up, to hold the light on. So that's the bag that has all of the lights in it. That has the V1 in it. It has uh, the three uh, AD300s in it. it. Has all the chargers that's showing um, softbox. Let's see, which one is that one? Can you tell, Aries? I'll probably show it when we get get in. But they're really. Oh, sorry, I put myself on the mute. Sorry. Yeah. I thought uh, it's probably the AD65 or AD85. Yeah. It's one or one the other. Those. Yeah. It's one of the mm -hmm. others. We can probably go to the next phase when we get inside the house. Okay, sure. Just kind of hey. show the. Okay, so there's the there's the uh, V1 and right, and that's the attachments that go on the outside the little the little kit. Beautiful, that, that attachment kit has. Great stuff. In it. The things I would use out of it quite often would be the warming filter, right? So it's got a different set of series of warming filters uh, that are just really sweet that you just pop on. The dome and then also the um, the grid. Those are the main ones that I use with this. But that's that's the AKR1 kit, guys. Just so you guys might want to know. Yeah. So this little stand is sweet that comes with it too. It's a little stand to let it sit down. So I'm gonna use that in a little bit to light up a, a room that became a, a little dark. So this just shows you, boy, that one little camera case can carry all of this equipment. You reckon it's a similar size with uh, your 2470 or 17 to 200? Yeah. Do what? The light. You, you reckon it's a similar size with your 2470 or 70 to 200? Ask that one more time. Yeah, I, I said uh, about the 8300, the size of 8300. Oh, oh, the, the size of 83, yes. The size of it is just mm. about the same size as the 70 to 200. Mm. Yeah. So let's go forward a little bit and see. Sure. Okay, so here, okay, so here I've decided to light up a lot of the room, right? So if I'm gonna light up a lot of the room, then I'm gonna use some sort of, I wanted to just try this translucent material that I've had around here at the studio forever. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to actually light the room up for a main light. And I'm going to use a fill to bounce off of the ceiling of the, one of these AD 300s. And the other one I'm going to shoot against the wall and then let the, let the light comes through. And then this will block off some light, go both some of the light. So it's not hitting, uh, so it's not hitting the subjects. Right. And so what I said before is that when we do that, we can expose for the subjects and the environment will light up more. OK, so we could probably fast forward a little bit, see where we are. OK, there's the setup where I have I have two cameras with me. Uh, one has one lens on it and one has the other lens on it in case I need one or the other to go back and forth. All right. Go forward a little bit. Sure. Okay, so 
I'm deciding, I'm deciding we have a lot of fill light coming in from the back. We're getting a really extra punch off of the fence. So the sun actually is bouncing against that fence and giving me a good bit of increased available light inside. So I'm just judging the light, what we have available, and one and trying to determine how am I going to get this whole, how am I going to boost that light up and get myself the whole scene a lot lighter. So we're going to bounce one off of what's what's actually in front of me, which is the wall that that sliding glass was on. We're going to bounce an AD 300 full power all the way up on the corner and just fill that room with a splash of light. And then on the left, that little room on the left, their dining room, I'm going to bounce a wall in there and create one big wall of light coming out and then just block some of it on them. So let's, let's go forward and see where we Sure. So this is just testing it. And I'm testing what uh, what's the exposure that I want for light and airy for outside. Mm. All right, we can move forward a little bit, I think. There we go. And then, so I take I had taken that. Um, I had taken the V1 and put it in, so there, you can see the AD300 back here on the left, bouncing against the wall, and all that all that gobo screen is doing is just blocking them a little bit, just just taking a little bit of light off of them, so when I bring them up to proper exposure, it'll blow out the other light a little. Bit. Forward. Yep. Okay, I'm doing a little test with Lisa in it. There we go. And I had put uh, a little, I, I had taken the V1 and put it in the room to the right of her, or her left, our right, uh, to light that room up and give a little kick on the side and bring up that volume because it was adding, it was like a black hole on the right side. Mm. So now we've got- I notice all your, all your images, um, you know, straight from the camera has so much details because nowadays lo yeah. lots of people just, you know, have this lots of shadow areas. Does it make sense? Yeah. I think it's right. amazing how multiple lights set up with the few lights actually make a huge difference here. Yeah, that was just two lights, guys. Mm. You can see it bouncing against the wall in the back, and then that one bouncing against the wall on the left, and then the V1 in the right in that in the right room, and and then exposing the shutter so that it will expose properly for that light for the light coming through in the outside. And wow, look, I mean it's 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 quite remarkable. Oh, I. Oh. There we go. There we go. So I mean that's a that's light and airy. <laughs> yeah. So let's go to the next scene. What do you reckon, like you know, um, Craig? Just um, out of curiosity. Um, between light and airy and the traditional, like what do you do with your classic, um, classic sort of style image? Yeah. Is there different ways? Are you changing the way you light or are you changing the way you're doing your camera setups? Like what, what exactly the difference, you know, when you make your... Um, yeah, so light, light, and area, light and airy is all about, it's all about shadow and highlight and compressing those mm. two together, shadow and highlight. And so mm. you have to do that for light, for a light and airy feel, and you're dealing with the scene, 
all of the scene has to have compressed shadow and highlights, right? So all the shadow transitions, all of the highlights have to be a lower ratio. So let's say one to two instead of one to four ratios. Mm. So there shouldn't be anything in the scene that has a four or more ratio to it. Whereas mm. you're dealing with maybe a darker tone, you can have mm. fours, fives in a scene and have a little bit of ones in the scene and be and tell your mm. story fine, right? But mm. in a in airy, you gotta get the whole scene to have the same kind of tonality palette to it. Mm. And you can do that it just with lights easily. Mm. A lot of people do it, most everybody I research, they do it in Photoshop with mm. pulling up the shadows uh, and taking out the blacks, but mm. it is in my, you know, for me, it's destroying the image as you do that. So I'd rather get it in the camera. And you can do that with these lights. Guys, I'm only using two of these 300s and it lit up the whole house, mm. right? Two of the 300s lit up the whole mm. house. That one little room, it had a little pocket, mm. right? We talked about that V1 having great ability to pop up a pocket. Mm. So would you reckon it's more about the fuel lights? You need a stronger fuel lights or something like that, or stronger kicker lights in this case, in this scenario? In this case, the scene light, because I'm dealing with outside light, mm -hmm. the environment was predominantly inside, right? But I had an outside light I had to deal with. So I had to get the outside and the inside to match. And I can't do anything about the outside other than shutter speed. And as I do it with shutter speed, it starts mm -hmm. making the inside dark. So I had mm -hmm. to use the lights to bring up the whole scene, the entire scene. So yeah, you could say that's fill, right? Because the scene fill had to be at a at, at the same level as the outside. Oh. I just love the way how natural it is. I can't even tell it's actually indoor shot, to be honest. Uh, it's a bit different from how you should throw softball, softbox, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting how the screen works like a charm here. Yeah, it does. Yeah, because it's it's letting the light, it's bare bulbing, letting the light fill everything, and the screen's just taking a little bit away, knocking off. It's go-bowing is what it is. Go-bowing a little bit of the light mm -hmm. from the subject, uh, getting you know, taking that away so that it, we can just expose for them and the scene gets brighter. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? <laughs> yeah, perfect, per make, make perfect sense. I never thought that way, that, that's why I'm so, so curious, that's all. I can't believe I'm teaching you. This is no, this is great, I was, I'm <laughs> enjoying it. So here I'm switching over to the white angle, I think. Because this is her little, she loves coffee. She has her own little barista area in there and that's her new little barista. So she she, is, uh, she also has a little degree in uh, as a pastry chef. So kitchen and- Oh my and God. Is important to her. Yeah. So this was fun. You guys must have lots of Great Thanksgiving and Christmas together. Someone's yeah. looking up the pastry. Yeah. So let's see, we probably have an image coming up. Probably from this. There it is. Yeah. I'm just going to pause really quick because um, I think Rohit has a question. Says, can he achieve similar results with 8200 and B1? Uh, like 300 is 300 watts, 200 is 200 watts. I guess in a sense, it depends on what power did you use, right, Greg? Yeah, I think you could actually do it with the AD200. These were pretty close to full power. Uh, mm -hmm. And you would just have to, you would possibly have to do, because I have only, I'm doing, I'm using, uh, you know, working with two people here. So the f-stop wasn't as critical. You know, so I could have got the f-stop opened it up just a little bit more because all it would have taken is mm -hmm. one stop up, and I the mm -hmm. 200 would have worked right. So, 
I think you could have done this with the two. I think I could have achieved this with the, the AD 200s in this room. Now, if the walls were all dark yeah. and trying to light this thing up, now you're dealing with, you just need, you probably need some more power. But these lights were, mm. these but, rooms were relatively light. Yeah. I think be reminded because it depends on the geographic location as well, right? If you, um, I think from where I can see, you know, uh, where Greg based in, it's not, it's beautiful summer with lots of sun. But if you're based somewhere in, I don't know, in, um, in London with lots of clouds, lots of shadowy days, I, I think it, you can easily get away with any 200. So base, basically it depends on where your location and the way, and you know, outdoor light condition as well, right? Right. Yeah, I would agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything's a little different. You just don't know till you get there. It's um, yeah. I love the power of the three hundreds, but you know these other lights. I think they would do well. All right, so let's get into I think the next phase. Mm. Again. So this hey. is very, okay. You, go ahead. Yeah. So is this is very. This is very, yeah, this is very different, guys. So this one, I wanted to light this room up like it was window light because I wanted to include the window in it. So you can see the 8300 outside. Can you see it there on the stand? Uh, and it's bare bulbed. Oh, hey. Yeah, and it's bare bulbed, and it is, uh, it's shooting through a, that scrim just to get the light to look like a window, all right? So let's back it up just a little bit. So we can see sure. the image on, there we go. So it, there should be an image coming up. So here I am. Let's see, it should be an image after I, okay, so that's me light, look at that, that's crazy. Mm. Like window. So it just looks like that window, that, that sun streaming through because I needed to pump up the volume of that light inside. Uh, and I used the strobe to do that. So that, that strobe, is good so let's see, let's get on, let's move forward a little bit, see if we can have an image of her thing. There we go, there it is. Look at that on the left, can you back it up just a smidge? Uh, back up a bit? Yeah, just see that one image of her in the chair, just a little bit. Yeah. There it like is. This? Yeah. So yeah. take a look at that. I mean, that is basically out of the camera, and that that looks like sunlight streaming in through the window and filling up and giving me dimension and light. Isn't that crazy? Mm. So all the lights are turned off in the room, and just using that one light to create all of this light in that room. I love the way you turn on the lamp, you know. All right, so let's go. Yeah, so here I am doing her individual portrait. And so we just laid her on the carpet and I'm using that light to stream in. And having that little reflector there to kick back to fill in to make it light and airy, right? <laughs> <laughs> to fill in that shadow on the right side, just to give it just that little bit of boost. All right. Mm, that doesn't really show, doesn't show up much. Okay, we could probably, Aww. yeah, we could probably end this and I'll just show. I'll switch to your PPT. Yeah, that'll be good. About that, yeah. Good. Okay. So here, here are some of the images so that you could see them. A little bit. Let's see. Um, get, where is it? Greg, if I may interrupt, uh, Rohi has another question asking about the share your lighting setup for the kitchen shot. Yeah. So the lighting setup, the kitchen shot is one eighty three hundred, actually shooting through the translucent, and then the, so the fill is filling up the room, right? Bouncing off the ceiling because it's bare bulb, right? So it's bouncing off the ceilings, the walls, the floor, mm. and then pushing through the translucent. So it's doing all of that and then pushing a 
a little bit of a darker spot through the transducer. And we're exposing for that darker spot and then letting the other fall off into a little lighter area. Work. Okay, so let's see. Here are some of the images. We'll just take through so you can kind of see them a little bit better. That's light and airy. <laughs> I, I thought it was really fun how we pulled in the outside inside and they're still in the air conditioning and we're just shooting through the door. We just pull the door open, take a little shot. Almost looks like they're outside. There's that inside shot. I just love that in here. <clears throat> Same lighting. I'm just getting close-ups. It's all the same light. Didn't move anything. Shoot the window. And that was her announcement portrait. Mm -hmm. her first, her first portrait. And then I took some scene shots just of the room so that she would have them. So just I just walked around and took shots. I love. Uh, just taking these little segment lifestyle images. And I really liked this because this is part where the screen where the scrim was not um, was not covering that one side of the window. And so on that side of the wall, you're getting this really cool uh, graphic feel, graphic light, which I really enjoyed. And so I wanted to share that. And then that's in that same on that same side. So there you go. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I'm actually kind of hungry because you know, with the lights bring lots of fuel lights. I just feel like this is all macaron to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I, God, I need a, I need something. I need my. And you keep on talking about the pastry. I was like, oh man, this makes me hungry. <laughs> It looks beautiful and yummy. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Thank you so much for your um, for your talk. Um, this You're is welcome. great. I'll, I'll, I love the behind the scene video as well. So, thank you guys. I, I hope you guys enjoy um, enjoy the shot as well. And if there's no further question, we will call it the day. And um, me and Greg will probably see you sometimes later. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.